Welcome to you this morning to Forest Heights Baptist Church here at 804 Tanger Drive. We're glad to have you with us this morning. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with us to uh, the Old Testament, to the book of 1 Samuel. We're in the 29th chapter. We'll be reading all 11 verses this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 29, verse 1 through 11 this morning. I'm reading from uh, the uh, NIV. I think you'll be able to follow along with me this morning. The Philistines gathered all their forces at Aphek, and Israel camped by the spring in Jezreel. As the Philistine rulers marched with their units of hundreds and thousands, David and his men were marching at the rear with Achish. The commanders of the Philistines asked, What about these Hebrews? And Achish replied, Is this not David, who was an officer of the Saul, king of Israel? He has already been with me for over a year, and from the day he left Saul until now, I have found no fault in him. But the Philistine commanders were angry with Achish and said, Send the man back, that he may return to the place you assigned him. He must not go with us into battle, or he will turn against us during the fighting. And how better could he regain his master's favor than by taking the heads of our own men? Isn't this the David they sang about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. So Achis called David and said to him, As surely as the Lord lives, you have been reliable, and I would be pleased to have you serve with me in the army. From the day you came to me until today, I have found no fault in you, but the rulers don't approve of you. Now turn back and go in peace. Do nothing to displease the Philistine rulers. But what, I ha what, but what have I done, David asked. What have you found against me, your servant, from the day I came to you until now? Why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king? Achish answered, I know that you have been pleasing in my eyes as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the Philistine commanders have said he must not go up with us into battle. Now get up early along with your master's servants who have come with you and leave in the morning as soon as it is light. So David and his men got up early in the morning to go back to the land of the Philistines and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. So what is going on here and what, why is it so important? Well, we've had a, a bit of a break uh, back earlier in chapter 27 verses 7 through chapter 28, verse 2. It, you can go back and look if you want, but there is the situation in between chapter 28 and verse 2 and down to here, verse this chapter 29, was the interlude, if you will, or the breakout where Saul goes to the witch at Endor and finds out about his situation. In the meantime, though, they've been camped. These two uh, nations have been camped in their places, Aphek, uh, was uh, the place where the Philistines were, and that word means simply fortress. Uh, and so they're in this fortress city, which goes all the way back to Joseph and all that. But anyway, and, and where are the uh, the uh, Israelites? Well, they're over in the Valley of Jezreel, uh, right there. And so uh, they're camped out. These two places may be about 20, 30 miles apart, something like that, maybe closer, hard to say exactly where these were precisely or where the armies were. But anyway, they're separated. And you might remember that Achish, who uh, had uh, entertained David uh, there in, in the Philistine territory, had called David up and to, to, to serve with him as his bodyguard uh, because he trusted him and all that and, and that kind of stuff. And so uh, that's the setting. And so we've jumped back to the battle that's at hand and this... Uh, situation and now they're about to go into battle and as was their practice at that time these rulers these people these Philistines and might remember if you don't and I'll let you in on this the Philistines were was a was a kind of a, a group of, of cities that were lead, led by leaders there were five of these kings uh, that then Achish was one of them and so that's who these other commanders are they're all had equal authority at least Achish had been given the kind of uh, deference, if you will. He lived in Gath, and so he had 
uh, that territory and each one had their own city, but they all were equals to, 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 for the most part. So when they, when one spoke, they all were on the equal terms. So when these other four commanders to speak to Achish during this conversation we're hearing here about David, they had equal standing and certainly because there are four of them, uh, they outweighed uh, Achish alone in his uh, decision. Anyway, so what's what's been happening here? Remember that David was anointed king. Saul was the king. David had been anointed king. And over the course of several years, uh, Saul had been jealous of David. Matter of fact, somewhere around seven plus years, Saul had chased David around the countryside trying to get rid of him. Uh, there were 10 unsuccessful attempts or more, depends on how you count them, but at least 10, that uh, where Saul had tried to kill uh, David. So after uh, all of this happened, David, it seems, grew weary of the resistance and weary of being chased around his own country, the Israelite territory, and he uh, takes uh, residence or takes up refuge, if you will, in the Philistine territory. And when he does, he meets Achish and convinces Achish to let him have some place. And Achish sends him to Ziglag. And there he lives. Now, you might remember also that uh, while he was there, he was there for 16 months. Achish says a little over a year. It was something around 16 months. He, David, was over there with his men. And what they were doing was they were raiding all these other towns, which were Philistine towns. And he would take... Uh, no prisoners, leave no one alive and take the goods and the booty and keep some and then bring the rest back to Achish. So no wonder Achish thought he was a great guy and no wonder these other guys didn't think so. Uh, they, they may have, uh, you know, figured out some of this stuff or may not have, but there's something that bothers them about David and David's loyalties and where, where they lie. So the question then is, David has his own problem. David's own loyalties are kind of confused. He, uh, he knows that or believes that he's been anointed king, which he has, and the, Israelite, and the Israelites are his people, yet he has gotten tired of the battle. And not just one, but many. And in his weariness has made a decision to go to the enemy. And that's kind of the setup here, I think. That's his dilemma. Now, because of this, his, uh, he's now been uh, kind of pressed into service here uh, to one of the kings of the enemy to go against his own people, which uh, I'm sure was a problem. Uh, and I'm sure that this created some thinking and, and everything, even though he had been. But nevertheless, here's his dilemma. He's already been there a long time. He's already uh, created this relationship. And now this relationship is going to result in him having to go to battle against his own people and so on and so forth. That's kind of where we are. And, um, and so now then, what, what is this about? Well, this is kind of like this little boy in his Sunday school class when the teacher was given the, the, a lesson on the rich man and Lazarus from the New Testament, you might remember. And uh, the, the Sunday school teacher talked about how, uh, how good Lazarus' situation turned out to be and how bad the situation of the rich man was. And uh, he pointed out how the rich man was in hell and Lazarus was in heaven. You know, we're talking about a young uh, a male Sunday school class here and all of this. And so after he got all this out, Lazarus uh, was poor. The rich man was rich and so on and so forth. So he did what any good Sunday school teacher was. He asked the closing question and he asked them, uh, he said, now, which one would you rather be boys, the rich man or Lazarus? And one of the boys in the Sunday school class uh, looked at him and said, well, he said, I'd like to be the rich man while I'm alive and Lazarus when I'm dead. <laughs> so this is the horn of the dilemma. This is it. We'd like to have all these things in the world, but also heaven too. And uh, that's the problem. That's the problem. That's what David was into. David wanted to, to be at peace and not be chased around and not have to battle for for his kingdom that he had been given, anointed as king, but he was tired of it. And so in his weariness, he goes over to the enemy. This is what people are doing today. This is what has brought us to the uh, to such a low point in uh, church attendance and church participation, I think is 
the people are wanting, have escaped, if you will, to the world. There are plenty of Christians who have escaped to the world. In other words, they've left the church, in a sense, and what went to Philistine land, to the land of the world. They're trying to do what is impossible, according to the Bible, serve two masters. Why would they do that? Well, I will say the first thing that I put down here, maybe, it'll, and this is trying to match current events and words and things here, uh, beware of safe spaces. All you hear about today is safe spaces, safe spaces. Everybody wants a safe space. So they can feel like they're not persecuted or nobody's talking about them, whatever it is. And ever, I would go into that. You can look it up. You've, if you've read the paper or heard or saw anything, everybody's got to have a safe space now. Well, that is the lie of the devil. It is the lie that David has bought into that somehow or other there's a safe place he can go in this somehow or other that, uh, that he feels like he cannot endure the battles and the chasing of Saul. And so he's made a decision that the Philistine offered a safe place and, act, and space, and Achish did. And he lived over there in Ziglag in relative safety. But there is a deception in the idea that you can live a double life. There are too many Christians who want to be Lazarus when they're dead and rich men while they're alive. They have bought into the lie the devil tells that somehow they can live apart from the church community, apart from the relationships and the responsibilities that go with being a Christian and still have the benefits of it at some point later. Somebody has convinced them that that's okay. You do whatever you want to. God is stuck with the deal. This is another way of putting this. This is wanting eternal life while uh, living uh, temp temporally or temporarily. In other words, we want the eternal things, but, but we want the uh, temporal things too. And uh, maybe you can think of it this way. And I tried to come up with some different ways to understand this so people can. So they're, they're, uh, they want Jesus on Sunday and the world on Monday through Saturday. They, they, want, they don't want anything else to do. That's, you know, the people that even give any deference to uh, the Lord or Lord's Day or worshiping together. That rest of the time is my time. I don't need to be bothered with anything else. That's not just presence and attendance. That's also studying the Bible, reading and praying and being in, in, in fellowship and relationship with the Lord and other people trying to serve during those times. We all have or do have or have had jobs and responsibilities that during the week that that we have to tend to but that all those can be done in and guy and under the authority of christ but the people today and the people in david in his day he wanted both he wanted the desire he wanted the kingship of israel and the homeland but he didn't but he also wanted peace and tranquility and safety and that's what people today want. People want God. They want Jesus. They want salvation. They want something. They want the peace, but they also want safety in their safe space. They don't want any disruptions, any trouble, any you know turmoil. They want any of that stuff. A lot of people come to Christ, coming to Jesus, looking for something. What? They, they look at it, put it in terms of the all the home improvement things you see on TV, they want a remodel, not a new build. They want Jesus to remodel them a little bit, but they're not interested in a tear down and a new build. And that's, that's, that, that is, a, is a dilemma. That's a problem because you can't have both and you don't. Jesus didn't offer a remodel. He offered a rebuild, a new build. Old things have passed away and new things have come. That's what Paul put. Jesus said, for those who struggle with the, with the, trend, with the turmoil and the, and the uh, difficulty that we find in today's world with all of the cultural things that are going on and all of these things that seem to be bombarding the church everywhere you turn, you look around, you find churches and denominations falling apart and separating and splitting up and all that kind of stuff over, you know, lifestyles and gender and all this other stuff. Jesus said in John 15, 18 and 19, if the world hates you, 
Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but you have chosen. I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Listen to me, folks, brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever your denomination flavor, if you're watching this on YouTube or some other place, let me tell you something. The world loves you. You might want to be careful. You might want to check. The reason that denominations are splitting and churches are going all off the rails and all the, and embracing all kind of sinful lifestyles and sinful practices is the desire to be loved by the world. Everybody wants to be liked. Everybody would love that. Everybody would think find that. But let me tell you something. The world exacts a price for the love of them. Just like, by the way, do not let, let me miss this point, just like God does. If you want the love of God in your life and you want God to love you and you want to love God, then he has a price to pay. Follow me and me only. I am jealous. Beware of safe spaces. I've said it many times. The Bible says it. Jesus says you will have trouble when you don't. Be careful that you not move to the Philistine territory. David is here now with this situation. The other kings, and by the way, that does not mean God is gone. God is never gone. And God wants David to be king. And God wants to help you when you have made a bad decision or you backed up and, and hooked up to the world too closely. David is in a position here that's not good. And God wants to help him out of it. And God through, can use all resources. Nothing is off limits for God. No place he can't go. Nothing he can't operate with or use. And he uses the four other kings of the, land, of the enemy of the people of Israel to convince David's boss, his Achish, to tell David, go back. God does not want David to do what David's about to do. And David is caught in this situation because he didn't want to continue to fight the battle back in the homeland. And so therefore, God says, well, you made a bad choice and now you're in a pickle, to put it in a term. And he, so he wants, he wants him to make the right choice. So he says, well, I'll help you out. So he gets these other leaders to uh, call for his uh, sin back. We don't want it. Achish had been beguiled, if you will, by David and his gifts. Think about that. Had poured out all kinds of booty, bounty onto Achish that he had raided from, his, from Achish's other Philistine people, other brothers and sisters in Philistine. He had took it. The, go back and read. That's where David got all this stuff. He told him it was from some other places. So David lied to get this worked out. But guess what? He gave it to and Achish was so was bought out. How many churches, how many Christians are bought are sold out because of the gifts and the benefits that the world offers there? David had bought Achish's loyalty. You have a job to do. Be sure there will be a day of reckoning. This is David's reckoning here to say, to say the least at this point. What is he going to do? How is this situation going to work out? God is doing everything here to stop David or prevent David from getting into a situation where he's going to have to kill his own people, right? And be in a, in, be in a, in a midst of an army that overwhelms him. He only has his 600 guys and he's in this thousands upon thousands of Philistines who are four or five kings going out to battle, Right? We need to listen to the discernment of others. Even the enemy has discernment. When the enemy of this world says to the church, we don't want your God, we don't want your Jesus, and we don't want the moral code that the Bible teaches, then take their advice. Don't buy up to, don't try to negotiate or to compromise. 
David's double life is confronted, and that's what happens when people come to you and say, well, if you would just accept this, or if you would just accept that, or whatever, then we will come alongside of you. We will join your church, and we will uh, we'll give to you. We'll uh, talk about what a nice bunch you are, that you and I are compromising things that we will never get back. And the day of reckoning will come. Story of a lighthouse, a guard who was given a job of keeping this lighthouse, a very dangerous place, very dangerous place. And he was given this oil to keep the lamp burning that lasted for a month. So that was what they brought a month's worth of oil in and gave it to him. And he told him to keep the light burning every night. One day, a woman came up to this uh, guard and said, could she have some oil so her children could stay warm? And so he gave her some. And then a farmer came and his son needed a little oil for a lamp so he could read. And he gave him some. And then another uh, uh, came, uh, came for, some, for an engine that he needed to run to do something. And the guards saw that each was a worthy request and gave a little oil for each one to satisfy all. By the end of the month, the tank at the lighthouse was dry. And that night, the the beacon was dark and three ships crashed on the rocks and hundreds of people lost their lives. The lighthouse attendant came, explained that what happened, why he'd done it. But the prosecutor replied, you were given only one task to keep the light burning. Every other thing was secondary. You have no excuse. You see, each one of the requests was worthy. They were worthy requests. They were good things. It was not bad stuff. But he gave out and then when it was needed, there was nothing. And hundreds of people lost their lives in one night. You see, God gives us a task. He gives us this, carry forth my word, stand on the promises, walk the narrow way, enter the narrow gate, walk the the uh, way don't follow don't get caught up in this you see the lighthouse keeper is the same thing that the church and christians have been led away from many all throughout history god loves everybody and everybody needs to go to heaven amen praise god and that is true however there is a responsibility that everyone has and you and i compromising the what God has asked us to do or given us and told us to do to get that done is not going to accomplish the purpose. You see, the lighthouse guard is the same thing that the church is today and have throughout history made a mistake when they compromised with the world. The same thing David did when he ran off to Philistine to escape the charges, the, 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 the death threats and the death uh, things of Saul trying to kill him. They believed that there was no way that God could manage these other situations and still get done what he promised. You see, when Christians go out and back up and tie up and hook up to the world and buy into the worldly arguments of cultural this and cultural that, and this is, a, this is not a sin anymore. But you know why? Because there's five churches down the street that say it's okay, and the Bible still doesn't agree with it, but we've twisted it around and whacked it under this one thing that I hear all the time amongst Christians, at least in what they say, is the love of God. And somehow or other, that makes everything okay. Compromise, 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 buy into. You got to go along with the program here. Otherwise, you will disappear. You will become irrelevant. You will not have the funds. You will not have the people. You will not have this or you will not have that. Why is when people believe that God cannot, does not know about this, that our Troubles, God doesn't, as the song goes, knows all about our troubles. God didn't know that David was being hunted by Saul. He saved him at least 10 times over a, a seven-year period. What makes you think that he was done saving him because he promised him that he would have this to do, the king? 
When we buy, when the lighthouse keeper met each one of these people, they were worthy causes. They were genuine, honest people who wanted something and needed something, and he was going to help them. Because why? Because the same thing we always do. God can't do this. There's no other way. He forgot that he had a very important task, a singular purpose. You see, Jesus is our example. Jesus was called out to do many. You don't think there was a bunch of sick people? You don't think there was a bunch of dead people? You don't think there was a bunch of people who had all kind of problems and troubles and struggles? Yes, he said, and he helped some. He could have helped everyone. He could have stopped and spent all the rest of his life in one spot. But he told his disciples many times, we must go on. I have other things to do. There's something more important. And when it got down to the nitty gritty, Jesus left people un that weren't, that needed to be healed or could have been healed. He went on to another town. Was that because everybody in that town was healed? No. But he knew that the big picture had to be met. He had a job to do, a singular person to come and to live his life in the face of all of the normal, everyday stuff that went on in his day. The same stuff that we have to deal with. This person needs help. That person needs help. This needs help. That needs help. We don't have enough people. Blah, blah, blah. There's got to have this. We got to have that. Where's all this going to come from? And so on and so forth. And yet, he walked on down the road to another place. And his disciples were back there grumbling and mumbling about what were they going to get out of the deal at one time or the other. Or how come he didn't stay around here and do this and whatever this and that and the other. And most of the time, quite frankly, every time he called their, pro, their, their struggle, their spiritual, mental and whatever, a lack of faith. What did he mean? He said, you don't think that my father can't fix that? You don't think my father doesn't know what I'm doing and he's going to make sure that it gets done and all these little things that happen in the long, in the way, along the way are not going to get solved? He has an answer for all of that. The problem is he wants to know if you're going to trust him to work it out the way it needs to be worked out because sometimes you can't afford to drive the tractor. Sometimes you just kind of have to give up reading for a little while. Sometimes it's going to be cold and people are going to suffer. Sometimes. You see, the lighthouse guard never thought about the hundreds of people that were going to die the night the oil ran out. He helped a family. Well, that was good. Except it wasn't great. You see, good and God are two different things. Both words have almost the same letters in them. Except good has too many O's. It's like we don't believe that God will has a purpose. That it's like I can't understand it. I talk to people a lot and I get this idea. Do you think God doesn't know, as the song goes, all about our struggles? You think God doesn't know who's in office and where and what war is going on and what this is that and that's that? You don't think he knows that? You don't think he has a plan and a purpose and a way? He used the Philistine heathen enemies of David and the people of Israel to get David out of a tight spot here. He was about to get into a situation where he was not going to be good. It would have damaged him for personally and damaged the future of Israel in that situation. It would have caused a lot of problems and he got him out of it. By using these sinners, as they would have called, been called, heathen, non-Israelites, not the people of God, use them to convince Achish to, to send him back. Sometimes we just can't read the signs. Be ready when the decision is made. Be ready when it comes to decision time of what are you going to do. You see, Achish said to David, look, you're going to have to go back. These guys don't want you. Achish had to decide whether he was going to go against the four other kings or go with what their decision was. Achish had to decide that and he made a decision. Don't go with us, go back. And David had to decide whether he was going to go back or say, or try and come up with some story to tell Achish why he needed to stay there. 
The Lord always brings all of us. I am 100% convinced God gives us a decisions to make. He gives us places to make these decisions that will affect us. That we have the ability to, to make and the opportunity to, to set the course for the next period of time for ourselves. And he's anxious to see what we're going to do. He wants us to make the right decision. He wants to give the tools. He wants us to do. He wants us to find him in that. Maybe, uh, you know, this is going to be hard, but he wants that decision to be made. And we must make it. Because making no decision is a decision. There is no neutrality. There is no neutral ground. There is no agnostic anything. That's a dream. That's a wish. That's, again, people wanting to have a foot in heaven and a foot in hell, right? Well, they don't want nobody want to be a foot in hell. They want to have a foot in heaven and a foot in the world. There is none. That is a lie from the pit of hell that there is some neutral ground you can hang out in. You can be neutral. I, I will. I just kind of neutral on that. I don't have. Listen, there's wrong. That's wrong. That's a lie. Everything is a decision to be made. The question is, where will we get our help in making these difficult decisions? What choices come before us every day to make? Little ones, big ones, whatever you, however you gauge them. And it's different for everybody, I'm sure, different times in your life. But this is a question to make. David here, the Bible says, David, verse 10 and 11, obviously without necessarily saying so, decided the right thing for the time. He took the advice of Achish and went back to Ziklag. They got up early in the morning and went back. So David, whether he perceived God's hand in his life or not, he made the right decision. He went back. He did not and should not have went out to battle. He should not have been in Philistine land. He should not. But these things are all worked out because David made the right decision. After he made a bad decision, he made a right decision. Whenever you turn, listen, when we were going down the road the other day, yesterday, and we were looking for a place to eat. And there's four of us in a vehicle, at least three or four phones and GPSs, and we're looking for this place. And it, somehow or other, they had... They put on the Google three stoplights. Well, what was was one, two stoplights and a, and a stop sign. See, Google doesn't know the difference between a stop sign and a stop light. So they show it as a stop light. And I'm going along as the nav and I'm saying three lights and everybody goes, yeah, three lights and one, two. And the next thing you know, we go, there it is, as we drove by, <laughs> looking for the third stoplight. So we immediately did, we had two choices to make. One, we could continue on down the road in the wrong way with our bad decision, right? And misguided guidance. Or we could just stop and turn around and go back and make another decision, which was the right one, which was to go back down there and get and pull in and park, right? And so good news is we, we took a bad decision and we turned it into a good one by turning around and going back. And it was worth the, it was worth the effort. This is what happens. The choice is yours today. Which choice are you going to make? Every day we are faced with choices and choices. I don't know how many times the world blabbers, blabbers, choice, 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 choice. And I think that's interesting. I think all of us realize that this is not, the problem is not the word choice. The problem is not the fact that we have a choice. That's a gift from God. I, I, I believe that with 100% that we have a choice to make and that we're given it by God. Here's the thing. The question is, what is your choice? And is that okay with God or not? I am not against people choosing because that wouldn't change anything because I'm not in charge. And I wouldn't. But guess what? It's what you choose is what's going on. Everybody has choices to make. What is your choice today? There are only two ways. It's Jesus or the world. It's heaven or hell. It's Lazarus or the rich man. That's the choice. That is no such thing as this one and that one. If you live like hell, you can't expect to go to heaven on the last day because, well, that's what you'd like to do. We get the, we, we decide it. We call, hey, God, by the way, I don't know if you realize it or not, but I've been living like hell. And, uh, and now's the day and because God is love and love is God and blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, heard it on TV and 500 preachers preached it. 
you know, and read it in a book and blah, blah, blah. You're going to let me in, right? And Jesus says, depart from me for I never knew you. No, I'm sorry, you don't. You made your choice. A bunch of them. The temporary or the eternal. You see, we live in a temporary world. We sing a song in the Baptist hymnal called Beulah Land. It's a, it's a pretty universal song. I've heard it in other places. Beulah Land. Everybody wants to go to Beulah Land. Listen to me. If you want to go to Beulah Land, you've got to get on the Beulah Land Road and stay on it. Because when you turn off, you're going to end up somewhere else. Christians, you get off at the road and you're going to get in the ditch. And you're going to stay down there where the muddy water comes and the flood comes and other things happen. You notice how this happens. I don't know if you watch these shows like I do. I like to watch these, uh, you know, weather things and stuff like that. How many times have you seen people pulled off the side of the road and they're sitting there because of one reason or the other. And the next thing you know, some other people whipping down the road suddenly lose sight, sight of where they are, what's going on. And the next thing you know, they're running into people on the side of the road. Being on the side of the road is not a safe place, folks. You are not in neutral territory. You are in a dangerous place. Get on the road or get off the road, all the way off the road, but don't stay on the side of the road. Christians, you cannot be on the side of the road. There is no such safe place. You see, today is the day to decide because you may not get another. It's a dream. It's a pipe dream. It's another lie from the devil that somehow or other you can change your mind tomorrow or this afternoon or a, a little longer. You might have another chance, but you and I are only living in a lie if we think that we know the day and the hour of our death. Some people are so enamored. There's, you know what? I don't know if you realize this. There are some people who have come to a smarter, at least it's, it's sad. It's a sad thing. But they've come to some understanding that they don't know when that hour day is. And that bothers them so much that they're going to go ahead and settle it for themselves. You see, we don't know. You don't know. Charles this guy and Bill that guy and preacher so-and-so and preacher this and all of the road signs and charts and diagrams and all that stuff that they have invented and come up with to get people to come so they can tell them something, a lie to start with and then back up over it with a little bit of truth saying, these are the signs, these are the signs. Listen to me. The signs are you're alive today and you might not be tomorrow or the next minute or two. That's the sign. If any of these people had any idea exactly when it was, nobody in history has. And Jesus said they'll be wrong because they don't know. The Bible has a few stories that more than a few probably, but at least a couple where people thought they knew. And so they made plans and got it all worked out and then it didn't turn out like they thought it. So whenever they start all this and they spend two hours and get collected up a bunch of money and, you know, and spend a waste a lot of your time going through this verse and that verse and coming up with all these signs. And then if they aren't just a bald faced, complete charlatan liar, they will say, but yet the scripture says, as what Jesus said himself out of his own mouth, no man, and that includes all of us men, preachers or otherwise, knows the day or the hour. And they haven't been given any special information about that, contrary to popular belief. They haven't given any special information that any other man has not who hasn't read the Bible. That's why Jesus said no man. So we need to decide today. We need, if you're, if you don't know, if you've been an agnostic or a denier or whatever it is, and you want to decide whether you're going to follow Jesus and you want the, the eternal life and the promises of God, then you need to decide to follow him. exactly how he said, not some way that suits your lifestyle or your current situation or your hopeful situation. No, the way that God said. And if you're a Christian and you think somehow or other that you can live like hell and God is going to say, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, you know, whatever. That's going to be OK. I think you've got another thing coming. We have decided every single day. 
You see, if Peter got out of the boat on faith and trusted Jesus, and then when he took his eyes off the Lord, what happened to Peter? He started sinking. And the only reason Peter isn't at the bottom of Davy Jones' locker or wherever they were, the men or, the, or whatever it was, the Sea of Galilee, is because he reached out to Jesus and said, take, help me, help me, help me, Lord, take my hand. And Jesus reached out and said, I will. So decide now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, today we thank you that you're still, because we're still here, Lord, you're still calling. We thank you, Lord, today that we might make a decision for you. I pray for all those folks out there who don't know you, don't care anything about you, thought they could stay neutral, thought they could this, thought they could that. I pray the Lord this morning that this, somehow your word has spoken to them and that they are listening to the discerning things around them to tell them to make this decision now. I pray for Christians this morning, Lord, who've wandered off and lived and gone off into the Philistine territory bought into all the lies of the devil that you can do this and you can do that and we should do this and we should do that and violate all these things in your scripture. Somehow it's all going to be okay because, well, you're love. And you're going to just help them anyway, even if they did not do anything you wanted to do. Haven't lived any lifestyle. Haven't completed. They said that they can do this and it'll all be fine. I pray this morning, Lord, they would make a decision. I pray, Lord, these things in Jesus' name.